Hello and welcome. My name is Alfred Ball and I represent Education USA and the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the U.S. Department of State in Washington, D.C. Today's Facebook Live is about navigating the student visa process. If you're an international student and need help with the application process for a student visa, this program is for you. Joining us today are Jennifer Sudweeks and Emily Almas. Jennifer is a Foreign Service Officer with the U.S. Department of State. She has worked in many different aspects of consular affairs, including both non-immigrant and immigrant visas. Jennifer is joining us virtually from New Delhi, India, where she serves as the U.S. Embassy's non-immigrant visa chief. Welcome, Jennifer. Joining me in our studio is Emily Almas. Emily is the Associate Dean of Admissions and Director of Recruitment at Swarthmore College in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, where she coordinates international student recruitment. Thank you for joining us, Emily. Thank you. To our viewers, this conversation is meant to be engaging, so if you have questions on student visas, please don't hesitate to ask in the comment section on your screens. We will do our best to answer your questions live during the program. I want to take the time to welcome a viewing group joining us virtually from the Education USA Advising Center in Lahore, Pakistan. Maryam Zara Khan is the Education USA advisor there. Hello, Maryam. Can you tell us a little a, a bit about your group and their questions? Uh, so I'm Maryam Zara Khan. I'm an educational advisor at Education USA Center in Lahore, Pakistan. And I'm accompanied by a group of like 15 students. They're from all across Pakistan. They, a few of them have already gotten acceptances in different schools all across the U.S. Uh, some with full funding, a few are like paying out of their pocket. And they have questions related to what not, financials, uh, general visa inquiries. So we're all set for this session. Thank you, Maram. We will come back to your group throughout the program. So to begin, Jennifer, can you start our discussion by sharing some insights on the student visa process? Yes, I can. First, let me say that international students are really important to the Department of State. They are one of our top priorities. We recognize the important contributions that students make to the college communities and university communities across the United States um, and the academic cooperation and opportunities that come from having international students mixed in with regular classes. We're committed to supporting US, the U.S. academic community, and um, we also try strive very hard to have efficient visa processing while at the same time meeting our national security and border security requirements. National security is our top priority when we're adjudicating visa applications. Every visa decision is a national security decision, and so that's why we have an extensive screening process for each applicant. However, worldwide, most students, in fact, the vast majority of students do receive their visa when they apply to study in the United States. We have over a million students at higher education institutions in the U.S. right now, and there's no cap, there's no quota. So if we could make that two million in the next few years, we'd be happy to do that as well. Jennifer, thank you very much. Could you um, tell us a little bit about what students should do first before apl applying for a student visa? Well, before applying to, for a student visa, you first have to be accepted at a university and you have to have received your form I-20 from the school that you want to attend. So once you have your form I-20, you pay the seventh, the Student and Exchange Visitor Information System fee at fmjfee.com. Then you can go to travel.state.gov and complete your visa application form that's on that website. And you can also find out what the wait times are at each embassy and consulate. That's really important because some consulates and embassies have very long wait times in the summer. We do our best to get students in first, but you want to include that in your plans. Um, so apply for your visa as early as you can, but no more than 120 days before your program begins. Um, after you have set your appointment, then you will, I mean, after you've um, filled out your application, you'll go to the embassy website and look for information on how that application process works in that country. Um, you pay the non-refundable visa application fee, which is $160. And we ask you, please do not book your airline tickets until you actually have your visa in your hands. 
Jennifer, thank you. Um, any, any tips specifically on scheduling the visa interview? Well, one of the things that I want to um, make sure to address is some sort of uh, tips on, on what to say in your interview. The first thing is that nobody can tell your story better than you can. You should approach this interview as an interview and not an exam. There's not memorized answers to questions that you should be giving. So the consular officer will focus on four things during your interview. The first is who are you and what are your ties? What is your story about your academic journey? The next is what do you want to do? Where do you want to study? Um, why do you want to study that uh, particular major or subject? The next question will, will be about how you're going to pay for your university. We have to be confident as consular officers that you can pay for the entire length of your study program. So make sure to have all that information with you when you apply. And um, we're going to ask you also about what you want to do when you finish your studies. So schedule an appointment at the, at the consulate or embassy that's closest to you. And then on the day of your visa interview, make sure to bring this list of things with you. Your form I-20, which the school has already sent to you your DS-160 visa application, which you that you need to print out the confirmation page after you fill that out on travel.state.gov. You need to bring your passport. It's important that your passport has at least six months left on it by the time you get in the United States and so make sure that it's not gonna expire in the next little while. You'll need to bring a photo that meets our photo requirements, which you can also find on travel.state.gov. Your visa application fee receipt also your SEVIS receipt, and any other additional documents that the specific embassy or consulate you're applying at requires. Thank you very much, Jennifer. During the visa interview, do they collect fingerprints? Yes, at the, at the visa interview, we will collect your fingerprints electronically. It's, it's a very easy and simple process. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for this very, very valuable information. I'm sure that our viewers are going to come back during the program with uh, questions about specific aspects of what you uh, just went through. Um, let me turn to you, Emily, and ask, um, can you tell us what role a university or college might play during this whole process? That's a great question. And first to everyone who's watching, congratulations, welcome. We're very excited to welcome you to colleges and universities in the United States. Um, there are some things that a US university or college can do and some that we can't. And certainly one of the things we can do and will do for you is issue that I-20 form. So it's really important for students to understand the process to getting an I-20 issued from your institution. I'd like to start there. I think a lot of students have questions about how that happens. Um, so the first thing you want to do is follow the instructions at the institution where you're enrolling. They might have steps on a website, for example. Uh, they might have a portal or an email address. You'll need to provide documents to the institution where you're enrolling so they can issue the Form I-20 to you. That includes things like information from your passport, uh, certification of your financial situation, how are you going to pay, as Jennifer mentioned, for your time studying in the United States. It might include an additional form. And a helpful hint I have for viewers is to understand the addresses that are involved in this process. Because eventually, the college or university will mail you that form I-20. And so you want to make sure they understand where they're supposed to be mailing it. Sometimes colleges and universities will give you a chance to choose how you want that mailed. And so I would encourage students to elect to have that mailed express mail or tracked mail. Otherwise, it could take weeks for your I-20 to get to you, and that just delays the process even further. So be sure to follow the steps that the college or university where you're enrolling provide on how to get your I-20 issued to you. And be sure once you receive that form to check it. Does everything match? Uh, is your name correct? Is the program and the start date uh, correct to your understanding? Because you want all of your documentation to match and you want it to be correct and accurate. What if it's not accurate? That's OK. If anything changes or there's a mistake or an issue, be sure to reach out to the college or university. Every school will have a person that you can contact, an international student advisor. It might be someone at admissions or an international student services office. You want to go and contact that person. And also just generally keep them informed if and as there are changes in the process. So that's the first thing that I would, I would be sure to mention. Um, 
coming to the United States to study is really exciting. And so you probably have a lot of questions as a, as a new student. Where might you get answers to those questions? Many schools have websites that have information about this process, the steps you need to follow, what forms they require, again, to issue the I-20, when you might need to come on campus, for example. So as a prospective student, you want to follow the information available on the website or in other information that's been distributed to you from the school. So schools can and will issue you the I-20. What schools can't do and won't do is issue the F-1 visa. Um, and so sometimes students have questions about the roles that institutions play in this process for a student going through the application. Um, we can certainly provide information to students. We can help ensure that a student has all the forms and documentation and paperwork they might need. Um, for example, you'll want to bring uh, your um, CVIS fee receipt with you to the F1 student visa interview, um, things like that. Um, unfortunately, ultimately, it's up to the student to go and do the interview themselves. Um, but if a student is not successful in that interview, you want to be sure to come back and tell the school that you're going to enroll in as well um, that that happened. And we can talk to you, counsel you about the next steps that may include, for example, reapplying, delaying your start date, and trying to reapply for the visa. That's all very valuable advice. Thanks. Thank you very much, Emily, for that great perspective. And I know that we'll be coming back to you throughout the program with questions from our viewers. Uh, now let's go to our viewing, uh, viewing group at the Education USA Advising Center in Lahore, Pakistan, for some questions. Uh, hello, Lahore. Um, can you give us your first question for our experts? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Majid, and I'm applying for a student visa. And my father is funding my graduate studies. Uh, but he has put all his uh, funds that I required in my personal account. And I have been working for the last two and three years as well. I have saved a bit of amount for myself. So uh, I still be showing him as my sponsor. Uh, will that have uh, any chances of his getting students? OK, can I ask Jennifer, did, did you hear the question? Are you able to answer? I think I can answer that. We actually don't. Um, as consular officers, we don't really consider parents a, a sponsor. We would consider that family funds. And so what you want to do is bring your financial history of where those funds came from, be able to talk about you know, um, how your father has been saving over several years, maybe bring bank records, and, um, and, and your also income. You might want to bring some pay stubs and things like that to show um, if the consular officer asks you to provide some financial information and documents. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, Lahore, do you have uh, another question for us? Yes. Uh, I had a fully funded scholarship. Uh, so is it required to uh, show financial statement to support my visa application? So I think that's for me again. If, you, if your scholarship covers everything that's listed on your I-20, including room and board and books and miscellaneous expenses, all you need to do is bring the evidence from the university that you have the scholarship. If it's only a partial scholarship, though, which many of them are, they'll cover just tuition, then you'll need to make sure that you have enough to pay for your personal finances. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent questions, Lahore. Thank you very much. And let me turn to Emily to follow up on that. Mm -hmm. I assume schools, if they are providing scholarships, mm -hmm. should, I mean, a best practice is to lay out exactly what is being provided so that students can inform the consular officer of that. Is that correct? Ab absolutely. So part of submitting the documentation um, to the institution so that we can issue a, a student a Form I-20 is the cost of attendance. And so that includes room, board, books, and personal expenses any uh, necessary or required fees as part of coming to the college. And as an institution, if you're awarded a scholarship or financial aid, for example, um, the school should outline what precisely you're being given. And then your I-20 should illustrate the remainder, how it's being paid for, for example, personal funds or um, a family member, something like that. So you'll want to make sure to bring with you and have on hand any documentation related to what's being offered to you from your school. It might be a scholarship letter. Um, certainly that should be reflected already in your Form I-20, but always good to bring all of your documentation and paperwork with you. So be thorough and be prepared and make sure, and if the school has provided you mm -hmm. with something, make sure that they have documentation yes. that shows that, right? Absolutely. Because everything helps during an interview. It does. 
Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, Lahore. Excellent questions. Um, let us go to our friends on Facebook to see um, what questions. Uh, Tongo from France would like to know, what type of visa is needed for an internship after completing a semester of study at a university? Um, Jennifer, could I turn to you for that? Um, yes, and I can actually only guess because I don't have the specifics in front of me, but in general, internships are usually on a J-1 exchange visa, um, but you can do an unpaid internship as part of academic credit on your F-1. You really, if you're already in the United States, I really want to talk to your university about those regulations and which visa they think you should apply for. That's very good advice, sir. If you're in the United States, make sure you speak to your own university, your own institution to get information. And I, uh, Emily, I assume that's common. Absolutely. So there are a variety of ways that a student could do an internship while they are a student, but it's important to talk to your international student services advisor at the university or college where you're attending before engaging in that. You want to maintain your status on an F-1 visa. Uh, something you might have heard of before called curricular practical training or CPT for example, uh, that could be what this student is referring to. But most importantly, check in with the international student advisor at your college or university first, and they can help figure out what kind of paperwork or arrangements need to be made in advance of doing anything like engaging in an internship. Thank you both. Excellent advice. We have uh, the following questions from an international student uh, who would like to know, can I apply for a visa before I have been admitted to a college uh, or university, Jennifer? So yes, you can. Actually, there's something called a prospective student visa. It's a B2, uh, sort of like tourist visa. And we can put the name of the school that you're interested in on that visa, or you can travel on your tourist visa or the visa waiver program to go look at universities in the United States if you want to see them in person before making your decision. But once you are studying full time, you need to be in status on an F1 visa. and it's much harder and it takes a lot longer to switch that status in the United States. So we would suggest probably if you're not on a prospective student visa, that you return to your home country and apply there before studying in the US. Thank you very much. That's very, very interesting to know and great for students who want to check out different colleges and universities. As you know, we have 4,700 uh, accredited colleges and universities throughout the United States, one for, for everybody. Um, our next question is from Martin, who would like to know what happens if you get the visa but can't travel to the United States to start the university program due to family problems? Uh, Jennifer. So. It's going to depend on how long your student visa is valid for and your form I-20. So this is a case where you'll want to be talking to both your university and the consulate. If your visa has already expired, um, then you're going to need to apply for a new visa. If your visa is still valid and you're still attending the same university, um, you might contact your university and get them to send you a new form I-20 with a new start date and you might be able to travel on that same university, uh, on that same visa, but definitely ask the consulate or embassy in your school first before doing that. And Emily, I assume that's common. Schools issue mm -hmm. I-20s all the time mm -hmm. because student status changes? Absolutely. So if there is a change, it's important to be in touch with the International Student Services Advisor um, or designated school official, whomever you've been instructed to check in with at your university or, or college. and and tell them what has happened or what is changing, maybe ask for their advice in some cases, um, and they can either reissue an I uh, Form I-20 or work with you to figure out your future plans. Thank you. So Osama asks, can I work in the United States after I finish my program, my course of study? Um, Jennifer. So there are some circumstances in which you can. We mentioned curricular practical training before. Emily talked about that. That's during your course of study. You can also work afterwards in optional practical training if you didn't do the curricular practical training. And um, there are limitations on that and limitations on the kinds of jobs and how long you're allowed to do that. So again, please talk to your school's international advising office before moving on with that program. It has to be authorized on your I-20. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Our next question is from uh, an international student from Pakistan who's already in the United States on an F-1 visa that is going to expire in 2020. And she says, I'm going to graduate from a master's program uh, in July this year, 2019. I got accepted to do a PhD from another university that's going to start this year. It's very expensive to go back to Pakistan. Can I get my visa renewed in Canada? Or can I get a new visa in Canada for the course of study I'm going to start? Jennifer. So if your visa has already expired, but you're in the United States and you're in student status, you probably do not need to renew your visa until you're actually going to go home to Pakistan or unless you want to go to Canada on vacation. Um, if you're just going to Canada on vacation, then you can try to apply there. Just make sure to bring everything that you would bring to a normal student visa interview. It's the same whether you're applying in Toronto or Mexico City or in Lahore. So um, you can do it, but it, what I, um, if you are in the United States and CBP has given you duration of status, if they wrote D slash S on your visa, that means they let you stay in the United States for as long as you are current in the SEVIS system. So again, make sure your school transfers service properly and you don't even need a new visa to start your program if you don't leave the U.S. Jennifer, this just to come back to this, this raises a very interesting topic of the difference between being in status and having a visa. If I understand correctly, the visa is for travel, is to be able to come and go uh, in and out of the United States, whereas the status part is what's especially important for students who want to be in proper status while they're in the United States, and they're not really the same thing. Is that right? That is absolutely true. They are not the same thing. The visa, we explain, is your ability to knock on the door of the U.S. Your status is your ability to, to, to stay there. And when you arrive at the border, the officers will tell you how long you're allowed to stay on that status. As long normally for students, as long as the school keeps your SEVIS information updated, you can stay in the United States. But again, you need to report to the school, you need to talk to your international student advisors and ask them to help you figure out what for you. So as long as I, as a student in the United States, I keep my school informed, I'm in status, they keep me updated, even if my visa has expired, that's okay because I'm properly in status in the United States. But then if I needed to travel, as soon as I leave the United States, I need to get another visa to come back. Is that, is that correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. That, thank you very much. That's great. And um, Emily, is that typical? Does that ha I mean, is that something you see often um, in international students that they, for example, may not have a valid visa, but they're in status and they have simply said, I don't, I don't, I'm not planning on traveling. I'm not going to, to leave. So I'm just going to, you know, be in status mm -hmm. properly and study. Mm -hmm. And then I'll get a visa whenever I need it when, if I leave. Absolutely. Um, it, as long as you are still in your duration of study, which is the terms of, of most status, um, you are you're fine to remain in school as long as you're keeping up with any requirements about checking in or updating the International Student Services Office on your campus. Um, and so the only issue is if you, as you mentioned, leave the country, then you will need a valid F-1 visa to re-enter the country if it has um, expired. Right. And all documentation related to that. So for example, an unexpired passport, things like that. So even if the status is fine, mm -hmm. Uh, if your visa has expired, you need a visa to travel. And That's then correct. You, and you get that outside the country. That's correct. And I just want to mention, we're talking about international travel. So one of the real joys and benefits of studying in the United States is you have the opportunity to travel freely throughout the United States without um, any any concern. So I really encourage students who are, are studying in the U.S. to take advantage of that, um, to go and see a different part of the country. The United States has a really um, broad array of histories and geographies and cultures and food, such great food, um, in many different parts of the country. So once you're in the U.S., uh, you should feel free to take advantage of those opportunities to travel. That's that's fantastic. So, And we keep saying, you know, not only just 4,700 schools, but all the way from Alaska to Puerto Rico. Absolutely. You know, it's all the United States, mm -hmm. and we the huge country to see and take advantage of.
of uh, travel and explore. Mm -hmm. So Definitely. thank you. Th thank you both. That's, that's great advice and perspective. Our next question is from a viewer who asks, if I already have a visa, visitor's visa, uh, or for example, I'm from a visa waiver country, um, do I also need to get a student visa if I come study? Uh, Jennifer, could you take that? Yes. Um, if you are from a visa waiver country, when you enter the United States, you enter on visa waiver status and you cannot switch to an F1 status in the United States. So if you're from a visa waiver country, you must absolutely apply for the F-1 visa before arriving in the United States. <coughs> As we mentioned before, we really suggest that you apply for your F-1 visa and not travel to the United States on your tourist visa. You can keep your tourist visa. Um, you can use that later once you graduate. It's if it's still valid, that's you can have both kinds of visas in your passport. But when you're studying, you really need to be on the property. Thank you very much. That's a great perspective. We have a few questions that um, have come in on the visa interview itself. Um, what happens at the interviewer? Uh, at the at the interview, our questioner asks, "Whom do I meet with, and what are they going to ask me?" Jennifer, could you could you t take a stab at that? Yes, I'd be happy to, because that's what we do here every day in New Delhi. You are going to meet with a consular officer, somebody who um, knows visa law and knows the circumstances of the country that you're applying in. And they're going to ask you questions, like I mentioned before, about your uh, process of all the universities or schools that you've applied to, your financial um, information, how you're going to pay for it, your journey. And you should think of this as an interview that you're gonna participate in a conversation with the consular officer. The last thing that we want is to hear a bunch of memorized speeches that don't really have anything to do with the questions that we've asked. It's, so it's not a test that you can prepare for, it's a conversation that you're going to have. So Jennifer, am I right? Um, that you know, in our system in the United States, as you say, it really is a conversation, an interview. In other countries, sometimes they just look at documents, but our counselor officers really want to speak to students. Is that right? Absolutely. And in fact, we a lot of times can issue a student visa without actually looking at the documents, just by hearing the answers that the question, uh, to the questions that we give the student and looking at the information that they've already provided in their application and on their I-24. So the consular officer might not look at anything at all except your passport and your I-20 form, and that's still just fine. That's the, you can still get a visa. Okay, so, stu so students should be prepared and they should be proactive and they're their own best representatives. Absolutely, nobody can tell your story better than you can yourself. So don't listen to, um, don't listen to people who tell you, oh, I said this and I got a visa just fine. Please do not bring fake documents. If somebody has told you that you should buy this package of documents and that will guarantee you a visa, mm. that is simply not true. Yeah, terrible. So, uh, just uh, be yourself and enjoy the interview because we're going to ask you a lot of questions about your school and it's, it's a good time to talk about how much you want to study in the U.S. That's, that's great advice. Our next question is also about the interview. Are students required to show funding for the duration of the program or just for the first year of the program? Uh, Jennifer. So you actually are required to show that you have funds in hand for the first year of the program and then show a plan that indicates that you will be able to pay for the rest of the program as well. So like we said before, for students who are on scholarship, that's a really easy conversation if it's a full ride scholarship. But for students who are planning on studying in the United States, they should bring all the financial documents they can to show one that they have enough money to give right away for the first year and two that they can afford the rest of the program so for master's students you're going to need to bring evidence of two years of funding for phds or for undergraduate if you want to go all through your phd you're going to have to have a lot of funding in place for that thank you very much jennifer so let's go back to education usa in lahore pakistan for a few more questions um lahore do you have uh, another question for us um, yeah, hi, my name is Maz Klein. My question is, what are the factors that can help us convince the visa interviewees that after completing our education in the U.S., we will be coming back to Pakistan? 
Okay, that's an excellent question. Um, Jennifer, let me turn to you in terms of the, the dynamic in the interview. Um, you know, are there things that uh, students can talk about in terms of their ties to their country? So we realize actually that ties for students are going to be different than ties for a businessman or a grandparent wanting to go visit their grandchild in the United States. We know that students don't usually have property, so we're going to ask you questions about your family. We're going to ask you questions about your plan, the reasons that you want to study in the United States and what you intend to do with that great degree afterwards. I think the thing that you're getting at is that students are very often refused because they do not overcome the presumption of immigrant intent. The way that our law is written is that you, we assume you are an immigrant first until you show us that you're not. So be, um, have goals, have aspirations, and tell us what those are. Just be honest in your interview about what you want to do in the future. Thank you very much. Excellent question, Lahore. Thank you. Um, uh, any, do you have another question? Uh, yeah, education you say so if you fa my family had applied for an i30 immigration um about 10 years back but it hasn't been processed yet we haven't gotten a call back and should that affect my f1 visa jennifer did you F1 visa, if you have already applied for an immigrant visa, we know that people's families apply for those sometimes years and years in advance. Just make sure that when you go to the interview, you're honest about that. We ask you that question on your application form, and you need to give us the honest answer. Um, as long as it's very clear that you intend to study and that you'll come back to Pakistan before your immigrant visa is ready, then it shouldn't be an issue at all. Thank you very much. Excellent question and important answer. So be, one has to be ex transparent in a visa interview um, and ready to talk about all aspects of, you know, uh, wanting to go to the United States, um, including when you have, um, you know, issues like that where there might be an immigrant application as well as uh, a student application. Um, so let's go back to some more questions from Facebook. They are pouring in. Um, our next question is, if I am denied a visa, uh, can I appeal? Jennifer, do you want to take that first and then I'll turn to you, sure. Emily. Okay, so there is actually no appeals process in the U.S. non-immigrant visa process. If you are denied your visa, the only thing that you can do is reapply, but there is no reason unless the consular officer tells you that you're ineligible for another reason. Um, there's no reason that you shouldn't just go ahead and reapply. Uh, the thing that you'll run into, though, are the long wait times. Um, and we prioritize students who haven't had their interview first. So make sure and apply early just in case. Thank you very much. Emily, do you, does this uh, happen occasionally? It does happen on occasion. This is really a situation where we would encourage a student to reach out to the college or university where um, they're going to enroll and to express what has happened. Oftentimes, institutions can provide information, maybe have a conversation, um, help a student uh, walk through the process of what has happened and what would be different when they're, re when they're reapplying for a visa the second time around. Are there times when you as an institution might say, hey, it might be better to wait a year? Um, depending on the timeline, it's entirely possible that a student may need to defer enrollment to an, a U.S. institution based on how quickly they need to be on campus. So uh, we know, as Jennifer mentioned, there can be wait times. It might not be possible if a student has been denied for them to go through the process again and get the visa to start during that start time. Um, it could be a financial situation. Perhaps something has changed in a student's financial picture and they need to wait to have the necessary funds um, to uh, make them eligible um, for this process as well. And so that's really where talking to the college or university where you plan to enroll is important and letting them know what has happened, what your plans are, and see the ways that they can help. Um, we aren't able to contact consular officers and ask them to give you a visa, for example, um, but certainly through the experience that international student service offices have, they have information, and I think information is really important. 
Okay, thank you very much. And I think we've got another question for you uh, from our viewer. What if I want to transfer schools? Mm -hmm. Can I change my program or course of study? So two questions yeah. in a way, transferring <laughs> schools once you have a visa and changing my program or course of study at the same school. Absolutely, you can do both things whether at the same school or another, um, it's again important to reach out to the International Student Services Officer for your institution and explain what you plan to do. So if you're transferring schools, you're going to need to transfer your, um, your CVS account, basically, um, and you'll get, need to have your new institution issue you an I-20 form, and there's a process for doing that. Every institution has a slightly different uh, array of steps you'll need to follow, but functionally, you'll need to get that new I-20 um, from your new institution. You do not need to leave. Typically, depending on your circumstances, um, you can do that process while in the United States as long as you are um, still a full-time student and in status. Um, in terms of changing your course of study or major, of course. Uh, many students choose to do that, um, and that's not a problem. You'll just need to update the institution where you're enrolled. Some schools may, may require you to come into the office and have a conversation with a person. Other institutions, especially large universities, universities may have an online system where you can input the data um, and they can revise your documentation and revise um, your information in the system, which is what's important. Thank you very much. Jennifer, from the perspective of a counselor officer, does it matter what a, what a student intends to study uh, when, they, when, when he or she is going to the U.S.? So we don't really consider the school as a factor when we are looking at student visas. Um, as long as the student has an I-20 from the school where they want to study, that's what we look at, the information on the I-20. So for us, it doesn't really matter if they start at one university and transfer to another. I, there are so many American students who do that. It's, an, it's a natural mm -hmm. thing. It's hard to know if a school is a good fit for you mm -hmm. um, before you arrive there. So it, to us, it doesn't really make a big difference. And thank you so much, Jennifer, for pointing out one of the big things we try to convey at Education USA. Of course, our services worldwide, our basic services are free to students. Mm -hmm. And our whole aim is to help students find the right fit in an institution, to find institutions where you will succeed academically, uh, professionally, personally. Um, and that, you know, there are so many institutions that offer different things. Our advisors are trying to help you find the tools to find the right place. Mm -hmm. So thank you for pointing that out. That's, that is one of the benefits of studying in the United States is that um, certainly our whole education sector is geared towards student success. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, that's always something we try to point out uh, from, from Education USA's perspective. So our following question um, I think is also for you, Jennifer. Will my visa interview be in English or my own language? So if you are not studying English as a second language, your visa interview will be in English. What we're looking for is a student who can contribute to an academic conversation and have a back and forth with a professor or with another group of students and contribute to that. So um, if you are, if it, your I-20 form says that you still need to study English, then some of your interview might be in your native language, but we'd still expect you to be able to have you know, everyday phrases and vocabulary at the ready so that you can tell us about your life at the school. That's great. So again, be transparent about what you're doing. Um, and this is a chance to show that you, you can actually do what you intend. Yes. Um, thank you very much. A related question. Can I work on a student visa? Can I stay with you, Jennifer? So you need to really talk to your international student advisor about that. If you are an undergraduate, and I believe after your first year, there are certain cases where you can work on campus. There are some cases where you can work off campus, but you can't just go out and get a job and then come to and tell your university that you want to work. You really need to have that all prepared in advance and have the proper authorization before you do that. So I'm going to turn to Emily in a second, but does that mean that a student who came and said, yeah, my school has proposed, has said that I'm allowed to work a certain amount of time or in a certain way, that that is something that's an acceptable thing to say to a, a, a counselor officer as part of the, the big picture of studies? 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Especially for graduate students, like we expect PhD students will be teaching classes or being research assistants, things like that. So there are, yeah, of course, please tell the consular officer that that's what your plans are, um, because some of that might be included in your funding package. But if you just want to work for a work experience and not attend classes, that you can't do on a student visa and you should not apply for a student visa. Thank you, Jennifer. Emily, let me turn to you from sure. the institution's perspective. Right. Can you go through, because it sounds like it can be, the rules are different for different kinds of students. They are, um, and I just want to echo what Jennifer said. If you're coming to study in the U.S. on an F-1 visa, your primary time in the U.S. should be spent studying. So coming to the U.S. and working is not the goal or the aim of, of coming in that circumstance. Um, there are opportunities, limited opportunities, typically part-time, generally 20 hours or less on campus, so maybe in a dining hall or a bookstore, um, depending on the student and depending on um, what degree program you may be in um, as a student on an F-1 visa. It's really important to talk to the international student advisor at the institution um, that you're attending to ask questions about what's allowed and what isn't. Um, you should not plan to fund your education in the United States through working while you're a student on an F-1 visa. That's generally not feasible and you wouldn't be certified for the financial component um, to be issued an I-20. So definitely check in in advance. But generally, there are part-time opportunities. Um, depending on uh, your circumstances, in the summer, there could be more work opportunity or opportunity off campus. Uh, also, again, depending some of the programs that we've mentioned, things like CPT, things like that. Um, but typically, it's limited in hours and scope and location, so on campus. The most important thing is just to check in with the international student advisor um, and make sure that this is aligned with um, the regulations that you're trying to maintain. So bottom line, students come to study, mm -hmm. work is a, a, a limited mm -hmm. side thing exactly. um, that is possible, but a student has to be showing the whole time that she or he is focused on studies. Absolutely. And that's really how you can take the most advantage of coming to study in the United States. We want students to explore um, the areas that they're located, that the, the schools are located in. We want them to enjoy American culture, get to know people from across the United States and maybe other international students as well. Um, so the focus of your energy while you're on a campus in the U.S. really should be studying and exploring and learning American culture and your education um, and, and not working. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks to you both. So um, Jennifer, a question for you. Our viewer asks, is a visa issued for the entire duration of my education uh, or my study, time of study in the United States or just on a yearly basis? So that actually depends on the country that you are from, the country that issued your passport. Visa duration is based on reciprocity. So whatever your home country gives American students who want to study in your country, we give the same length of visa. So in some cases that may be five years, in some cases that may be a full 10 years, in some cases it may be three months. So um, it, it really just depends on where you are from. Thank you very much, Jennifer. We have a, a second question, I think, that goes to you as well from Angel, who asks, who says, I received a student visa last year, but I didn't actually travel to the United States. I now have a new I-20 to I attend a different school. Can I use the same visa that I already have from, from last year to attend this new institution? So I would not advise that, actually, because when you arrive in the United States, the officers are going to ask you questions about why the the school that has printed on your uh, on your visa is not the same as the I-20 form. So when you get to the United States, you may have trouble. They may not even admit you. So if you're planning on attending a different school, I would definitely get a new visa with the right school name on it, and then you should have no issues. Thank you very much. Then that was what echoing what Emily <laughs> said um, earlier as well. Make sure that you are really be, uh, dealing with the school regularly, mm -hmm. getting everything updated, making sure that they do the paperwork mm -hmm. um, so that everything is correct as possible and that yeah. it's not a problem for schools to do that. Right. No, not at all. You want to make sure that your student visa matches um, the I-20, form I-20 that you've been issued. Um, and then it's also important, Jennifer mentioned this earlier, just to touch on something about the actual entry process. You want to make sure you're entering on your student visa. Um, if you had another visa in your passport, you want to make sure that you're um, being 
being issued a particular form, a, a form I-94, uh, excuse me. We won't get into those details, but it's just important that you enter on your student visa uh, because when you check in with your international student advisor um, at the beginning of your course of study, they're actually going to check to make sure you have all the right paperwork, that everything has been documented properly in the system and say that you've arrived on campus. On that note, while you're traveling, make sure you keep your documents with you. Don't put your papers and documentation in your checked luggage. You wanna make sure you have them in your handbag or hand luggage because you'll need to present them and you never know, you probably won't have access to your checked luggage till after you go through um, the port of entry. Absolutely. So keep the documents with yes. you on your person as absolutely. you travel. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent advice. Excellent advice for everybody. Um, so we had, we actually had this question, but it's come back, so I think it's important. Um, can I have two different types of visas at the same time, say a student visa and a visitor's or a tourist visa. Um, Jennifer, is that okay? Yes, that's okay. You can have more than one type of visa in your passport at the same time. If you are applying for, let's say you're applying for a new student visa and you have an old student visa in your passport, we'll go ahead and physically cancel that old one because we can't issue you the same one twice if that makes sense. But if you have a tourist visa, we'll just leave that in your passport. And uh, if, when you finish your program, you can travel in and out of the United States on that if it's still valid. Thank you very much. Um, our next question is from Louise, who would like to know, um, what is the specific uh, definition of full-time student status? What does that mean? Emily, can you Absolutely. That. So that's a great question. So every institution has guidelines for each of its programs that are authorized to issue I-20s for and what uh, meets the criteria for full-time status. So this might depend on the specific degree program or course of study, um, but you'll want to make sure that you are applying for full-time status because you need uh, to be a full-time student, um, except some specific situations in which you can talk to an international student advisor about um, to continue on as an F1 student visa um, holder. So you'll definitely want to check in with the international student advisor if for any reason you want to take a reduced course load, for example, um, if you want to go part time, as you might hear the terminology used sometimes in the United States, don't do that until you have a conversation with the international student advisor uh, because they'll know there's a minimum number of credits or credit hours depending on the program that you're enrolled in um, for your student status. So good advice. So lots of things are possible, but again, you have to be in touch with your international student advisor mm -hmm. to make sure that you are always in status and maintaining that status appropriately through the way you're taking your courses. That's correct. Typically, you need to be a full-time student. Um, so if there's anything other than that, you're going to need to talk to the international student advisor in advance of making that decision. Thank you very much. Let's go back to our viewing group uh, at Education USA in Lahore, Pakistan for a few more questions. Lahore, do you have a, another question for us? Yes, we do. Go ahead. Hello, yeah. Why did you summer? Actually, what did you ask that if a family member is supporting, uh, an educated family member, a member is uh, financing my education, so how is it viewed uh, against my application and what sort of questions can I expect from the visa officer uh, regarding it? Je Jennifer, can we turn to you first for that? So I'm not sure I heard the whole question. It was cutting in and out. It's about what financial documents they need to bring or? Uh, no, if, if an extended uh, family member is supporting my education, uh, so uh, how is it viewed against the, uh, my application? Is it considered a negative impact on my application? And how can I actually defend that? That if someone is supporting my education or financing my education? So. You're saying someone outside of your immediate family is supporting your education? Yes. yes. Okay. Right. So you need to be very clear with the consular officer on where that money is coming from, that that person is not a member of your immediate family, and you need to be clear about why they are willing to support you. Um, it really is going to depend on your personal circumstances. It could be just fine, or if it seems like it's long convoluted way to get money and you don't actually have the funding that you, you might need. I There's no one specific formula that I can tell you that will help you pass your interview. Just bring all of your financial documents and make sure that you tell the officer up front where the money is coming from. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, Lahore, do, do you have one more question? Yes. 
So uh, I got a fully funded admit, and my bachelor degree is in the form of uh, DSHIP. So is given visa the most appropriate visa for me? I'm sorry, you cut in there. Could you um, repeat the question again? Uh, I got a fully funded admit. Uh, my financial aid package, package is in the form of DSH. Uh, is J1 visa the most appropriate visa, visa for me? Emily, would. Did, are you able to answer that? I heard, I heard a little bit of your question. I think you're asking about which kind of visa you should be applying for. And if that was the question, um, I think you know different programs are going to be tied to different kinds of visas. Um, and so typically, if you're enrolling as a full-time student at um, an approved institution, and as mentioned, there are um, over 4,000 different fantastic colleges and universities in the United States to choose from, um, then you're going to need to be on an F1 um, uh, visa. Um, there are other circumstances depending on the situation. It might be an M or a J. Um, but generally speaking, if you're coming to the United States to study as a full-time student and if you're in a, a degree program, it's going to be an F1 uh, visa that you need to apply for. Um, the EDUSA website actually has really helpful information on this topic. If you're not sure what kind of visa is right for you or where to get more information, I always send students to the EdUSA website. They can find lots of great information there that can be really helpful. That's a great point. And, it, and likewise, the school would, would be in a position to Absolutely. guide students, right? Absolutely. If you're talking about a specific academic program, the school would tell you which visa you need and what visa they're, elder, they're able to issue um, documentation for um, that is going to be program specific. But if you're wondering generally what kind of visa you might want, check out, I would encourage students to check out the EdUSA website. Absolutely. The Education USA website has a lot of information, and we also refer to the website of our Bureau of Consular mm -hmm. Affairs, uh, where Jennifer works um, currently at, at Embassy New Delhi, um, and with a lot of very specific information about, about visa, visa categories. Thank you. Thank you, Lahore. We appreciate your questions and, uh, and your engagement on the program. Um, let's go to one more question from Facebook um, before we close. So this is for Emily. Emily, where can a student get more information about what to expect upon arrival mm. at their institution? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. That is a great question. Um, and one of the uh, great programs that many universities and colleges offer is what's called an orientation. So you may be expected to come to campus a few days before classes begin um, and learn about everything from where's the dining hall or um, how does it work to get your mail and your residence hall, um, as well as sort of bigger questions like uh, what is American culture like in the classroom? How do you participate in class? Um, can you go and talk to your faculty members? What do students do for fun? All of these great topics. But generally speaking, you'll want to take advantage of any opportunities you have to participate in things like orientation. Most colleges universities have on their websites information sort of step by step what to expect and how to enter and what to do once you're on campus. So pretty universal you'll need to check in with the international student advisor or designated school official on your college campus once you get there. That might be part of the orientation program. It might not officially be part of that. But either way you'll want to say I'm here. We'll say welcome, congratulations, welcome to the United States. Um, and make sure that all of that documentation we've been talking about is accurate and reflects um, correctly in the system that we have access to to double check. Um, first, uh, just I encourage students to be in touch with colleges and universities where you're going to enroll. If you have any questions, any problems, um, any issues, I had a colleague tell me a, a big tip that I never thought to mention to students before, but oftentimes if you're landing in the United States um, and connecting to a domestic flight, student, for example, might not know you need to, um, after uh, you go through immigration, get your bags from customs, go through customs, and then recheck them. So that's some little tip for you there. Um, but lots of great information on college and university websites about the actual process of entering and also what to do once you're on campus. We want to help you. So ask us questions. Let us know how we can be helpful. 
That's fantastic advice. And one thing from Education USA's perspective is that we are our advising centers around the world provide pre-departure orientations for students, which are free of charge, which we encourage you to attend. Oftentimes we'll do so uh, in partnership with universities, U.S. colleges and universities who may be visiting, who may be um, looking to do their own pre-departure orientations. So we want to provide you with the tools that you need to successfully start your studies in the United States. Unfortunately, we are almost out of time, uh, but before we conclude our conversation, Jennifer and Emily, could you each share a final thought on the student visa process or anything that you would uh, like to for our viewers? Jennifer. Sure, I would say my biggest tip is just to relax. Consular officers love interviewing students. It's our favorite kinds of interviews. Mm -hmm. Students are so excited and full of life and energy, and we love that interaction with them. So just be yourself, be enthusiastic, and tell us your story. That's fantastic advice. Uh, an interview is a great chance uh, to have a nice conversation with someone who is uh, excited about what, what you intend to do in the United States. Emily, any last words of advice? Yes, I would just say uh, we're really excited at colleges and universities to welcome international students to our campuses every year. So if and as you have questions, you want to know more, please don't hesitate to reach out to the officials on the school campus where you're going to be enrolling because we want to be helpful. And the earlier you get in touch with us uh, with any questions, the better. My number one tip would probably be to make sure that um, as you do different steps of the process, you save your documents documentation. So for example, if you like, if you have access to a printer, you print things out. If you have access to print things or you save them, you email them to yourself, you want to make sure to have backup copies of things where feasible. Just a little helpful hint. But know that we're all really excited to welcome you to American colleges and universities um, and congratulations on starting this journey. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for joining us today, Jennifer and Emily, and thank you to our viewers joining us from around the world. A very special thanks to our live viewing group gathered at the Education USA Advising Center in Lahore, Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. We also had viewing groups gathered around the world, including Education USA Advising Centers in San Salvador, El Salvador, Yaoundé, Cameroon, Baku, Azerbaijan, and Bamako, Mali, at American Corners in Pristina, Kosovo, Buea, Cameroon, and Gitega, Burundi, the American Corner in Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago, and the U.S. Embassies in Conakry, Guinea, Abuja, Nigeria, and Windhoek, Namibia. You can find more information about studying in the United States by visiting the Education USA website at www.educationusa.state.gov. There you can find information on the five steps to U.S. study, locate an Education USA center in your country, one of over 436 around the world, connect with us via social media, learn about both in-person and virtual upcoming events, research financial aid opportunities, and much more. Thank you, and please join us for future Education USA interactive web chats. Goodbye from Washington. <laughs>